today? Good. Nice, good, good energy. How's problem set two coming along? It's coming, it's coming. Again, make sure you uh, finish it up before Monday because obviously it'll be due. Uh, again, the big thing with problem set two is I've given you the pseudocode for a star. But the big thing that you're going to need to kind of sit down and think about, process, and do is how do you take the solution of A star and find the path, right? So that's where, again, as I've said a few times, the came from variable is going to become very, very beneficial to you. So again, do make sure to have at it, work through it. Uh, we'll be available via the piazzas and office hours, et cetera. However, that's not what we're talking about today. As you can see, we're going to be talking about ants today. And so the entire idea, what I want you to think about is if you go back to what we were talking about on Monday, right, we introduced this idea of meta heuristics. Big fancy $5 word, but all it really was kind of boiling down to is biologically inspired or nature inspired algorithms. We've seen something out there in the world that was not man made, right? And what we as mathematicians have done is said, hey, can I model that? Can I simulate that behavior? That's what simulated annealing was, right? Hey, the molecules are becoming very volatile. Genetic algorithms, hey, the theory of evolution, survival of the fittest. And so this is where if you've ever just sat down and, you know, seen a dead worm or a dead bug on the, on the, the dirt on the ground, right, suddenly after a few minutes or whatever, ants have found it. And they're just like surrounding it. And what they're doing is they are effectively just chewing on it to break down little chunks of pieces so they can tear it off and take it back to their colony. Well, if you think about it, like how do ants communicate with each other? And that's some of this that we're going to be talking about today is this idea, well, you know, they don't talk. They don't have like a language. They have a different way of going about that entire process. Well, we, again, as humans, looked at it and said, I bet I can model that. And that's exactly what they did because it produces conveniently, a shortest path algorithm that we can work off of. So again, as we've talked about it, we'll, we'll break down. Uh, we've spent time on these. Mostly today we're talking ant colony, but I've saved a little bit of time at the end of today's lecture just so you can see other types of algorithms out there. It, this is by no means the only five out there, but you know, again, this one's pretty pronounced, this is new and novel, and this one is also new and novel, but slightly doing a different approach. So again, the way I want you to think about this is we've been talking primarily, every one of the algorithms, the, the things that we've seen so far, have focused on a singular agent. But if you, you know, think about ants, and you think about ant colonies, and you think about the dead worm on the ground with ants surrounding it, there was a plural there, ants, right? It's not just one agent anymore. It's not just one entity, but we've just effectively thrown out tons of them with the hope that one of them finds food. And if we kind of look at this very simple, you know, linear, you know, one dimension, not one dimensional, but, you know, just one row uh, uh, environment, right? There's some way that this ant looks, starts to explore the environment until it finds that food source. And then what does it do? Well, it goes back to the colony because it needs to tell its you know, brethren. Uh, and so this is where what happens if there is that fork in the road. I know, again, I'm still working off of a very simple environment here, but now there's two paths going on. One, the top path, pretty short. The bottom path still gets me there. Still gets me there, but it takes longer. Maybe if we're looking again for this idea of a shortest path to some goal condition, especially when we still don't know it, right? This is our way of kind of 
uh, seeing a, one single ant for now and how it may be looking at things. And especially, you know, again, if this is the colony, as that ant only has one, or that agent only has one potential move to work towards, they go to it. And so now we're in a little bit of a, a conundrum, if you will. I have a left side and I have a right side. Or, you know, if you're thinking move up, move down, I have an up and a down route. Now, this is where I will say, you know, I'm going to start throwing math symbols at you. I'm going to start throwing math symbols at you. If you get lost, I'm doing my best to make sure that the math equation sticks, but we do have to learn a little bit of Greek today, right? And the idea is, again, if you look at this from the agent's perspective, I have one route, I have another route. Well, which one do I pick? And so with ant colony optimization, we introduce the first of our Greek, the ADA, the attractiveness. Hey, again, I have two possible pathways. Which one is more attractive? And we'll, we'll start plugging in numbers as we go along, but I, I, it's mostly, again, this idea, well, hey, right, this can turn into, you know, what's the attractiveness of taking that top route versus what's the attractiveness of taking that bottom route, right? Again, okay, fine, that, that starts to get us somewhere. But this is where we, we get to this idea of probability as well. That's that kind of other big fancy word we've got going on there. Well, hey, it's the prob what is the probability that the ant will take the top route versus what's the probability that the ant will take the bottom route? Let's arbitrarily say we don't, we've never seen this environment. The ant doesn't know anything about anything What's the probability of taking the top route? Say it loud, say it proud. 50-50, right? It's a toss-up. I don't know, and neither does this ant. It's a dumb little ant, right? Okay, I'm sorry. It's a dumb little ant. I need you. It's fine. Doesn't know I'm making fun of him. My point being, either way, right, it's a 50-50 chance. That's more what I'm getting at. Okay, all right, fine. But you notice I threw in another term because this is where we start to look at this from, again, this idea of we're trying to model what ants actually do. It's not just an eta, but you also see that we're also introducing something called the trail level or the tau. The way I want you to think about this, again, eta, attractiveness. How, how many ants have come this way before me, right? Because again, if you're thinking about this from the ant perspective, ants kind of, you know, try and follow each other because that's, you know, they typically assume that there's some information there or food source. I'm not a biologist. Ants, right? So the idea here is, now I have a second math, you know, Greek symbol that I got to be working off of, eta and tau. Both of these symbols are going to be floating around in space. And when I'm left or when the agent is left with this, do I take the left side or do I take the right side? It is through these two calculations or these two values that we derive a decision, right? Again, this idea that I've said probability of which side do I go to. So let's arbitrarily, again, without using numbers, without worrying about turning this into the math equation for a second, let's walk through just like the ant would be doing, just like we would see in the real world. The ant picks a pathway, right? You know, random walk or 50-50 chance, took the top one. It continued down this pathway until it found the food source. And so, what does the ant do now that it has found a food source? Brings it back. And this is where we start to now play a little bit of biology, right? What does an ant do as it's walking back? Say it loud, say it proud. It drops a piece. 
it grabs a piece. Yeah, we'll say, so it's grabbing the piece to bring it back. But as it's bringing that piece back, what's it also doing? <laughs> it's a smell thing. It's dropping pheromones. So again, I need a food source. I have a food source. Tuffy's beer. My food source. Well, I need to make sure that everybody else knows that the beer was over there. So what am I doing as I go back to my colony? Because that's how ants drop pheromones. They're, they're, they're pooping it out their butts or whatever. Again, I am not a biologist. I am a mathematician. <laughs> that's not how it works out. Again, I am a, not a biologist. Anyways, right, again, what we're trying to get at is, hey, there's multiple pathways as well. You can see the ant could have gone the bottom route and still found that food source. Or, again, if we're thinking about this from just that kind of concept of real world application, not real world, real world simulation, what if the ant just goes in the random wrong direction, right? Well, again, if it loses its way, for whatever reason, you dropped water on the ground and so you washed away that pheromone, it's lost. And what will happen to that ant? It will die, right? Well, that's perfectly fine. Again, when we think about this from taking the biology and turning it into a math equation, no real ant is dying, right? We're just thinking about... Uh, this not being able to find any pathway before we move on, right? We cap how many moves this single agent can do before we're like, ah, this one, don't worry about it. But either way, again, as we, as our agent finds the food source, finds the goal condition configuration, what's it starting to do? Well, it's going to return that back. And this is, again, the idea of taking what we see in biology, the ant found the food source, so the agent found the goal condition. And now as it's going back, it's leaving a pheromone to say, hey, this pathway that I took to get to this goal condition, it was a good one, right? Because it got me to the goal. So here's your animation. That was your animation. Thank you, thank you. My point being is, well, again, we now are starting to take that and turn it into numbers, right? Again, I was showing it as more demonstration, but now we're starting to transform into values. I still haven't told you how these work, and we'll get there. But again, as the ant is dropping that pheromone, right, that's a numerical value that's saying, hey, this path has a, you know, leads to a goal condition. And let's arbitrarily say, instead of working off of one ant, now I'm working off of five ants. Specifically, three ants take that top route, two ants take that bottom route. Because notice what happens as it's dropping pheromones. More ants are dropping pheromones up top because it's, you know, it's a shorter path. I made it so that more ants are selecting that one, right? That's on me. But that worst path, only two pheromones are being dropped. And we can shift this, right? It, you know, it, does it have to be one, an explicit one, and we're incrementing by one? No, right? What if I continue to expand it? Instead of it being five ants, it's 20 ants. And instead of them dropping one pheromone, it's one-fifth. Because, again, don't think of this like, what is one-fifth? It's a value. Right? I'm just saying, hey, drop... This is how much pheromone you drop when you are walking back from your, your goal condition. So in that same kind of sense, you can see as more ants sort of traverse a single path, that tau level is what we'll, we'll start to see in a second. That tau level or that, that, that pheromone that's been dropped is getting bigger because more ants are walking down this path so, again, more ants are dropping their pheromones, and you can see, again, it's getting bigger. So, for our initial state, let's just think everything is a one, right? All possible pathways are equal in the beginning, right? Because, again, I don't know. The ant doesn't know which way is the food source. It doesn't know if there's a food source out there, 
right? It doesn't know that there's a goal condition. So all possible pathways are just being initialized as one to start. Then what? Well, again, this is where, like I said, we're introducing this idea of probability and exploration because the ant, the agent, doesn't know, you know, if this is a good or bad path. It only knows or we take what we're about to see. Instead of doing 50-50, we want to start looking at it from a, a probabilistic perspective. And I'll come back to this point, but to get you to think about it for a second. Right? You use math.random. Math.random is going to produce a random number from 0 to 1. This part you all, you know, get. Remember when you first learned about math.random. You probably, maybe, were introduced to the coin flip concept. Hey, if math.random less than 50% or 0 0.5, right, here's a pathway or heads tails, right? Still on that. I'm not going to change this because I want to get through a few pieces of, on my slides, but start to think about this idea when it comes to, instead of me going heads or tails, top or bottom, left or right, right? Because here's the math equation for it, right? We take that eta, that attractiveness, and we take that tau level. And yes, it's a big ugly math equation. I, 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 uh, yes. So you start to wrap these things around. Boom, boom. And that's just a multiplication going on there. And it's being divided by a sigma of all the possible options that we can be working off of. So the eta of x to z, tau, Because remember, you, these are symbols. You've seen these symbols before. It's sigma. That's a for loop, running total, right? You got it. You got it. Now, yes, I do have a few other symbols going on here, right? K. What the hell's K? The way I want you to read this is, what is the probability that ant K goes to this location? What is the probability that a particular ant, since we're dealing with multiple agents, goes to a particular location. So I have two of them to work off of. Okay? Good. So again, that's here me saying those types of things. One of the things that we have to start dealing with is I haven't really told you the values yet. I've shown you this giant math equation for probability, and I have a bunch of ones on the screen, but I, I still haven't told you, like, attractiveness, or, or still haven't really told you how to get to tau, I, or you know, how do we work tau, because it's just a one right now, right? So what is attractiveness? And this is where we can change how we think about this, right? This is where maybe we do know the goal condition, but we don't know the pathway to the goal condition. Well, again, you have the abilities of like heuristics, right? Manhattan distance, Euclidean distance. You could calculate out those types of things. And specifically, though, here's where we get into a bit of a conundrum, right? I'm producing a pathfinding algorithm using ants. What is typically part of, you know, trying to do pathfinding algorithms? We are always trying to accomplish what in them? Find the, shortest path. Find the shortest path. Well, the reason why I kind of present that is if you were to count up the, the tiles from here to the food source, right? One, or one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So, oh, it takes ten moves 
to go uh, to t in the top half versus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. 14 on the so smaller path. Reason why I kind of present that, right, just to kind of you. Where am I going to store that information? I'm going to put it up here. Top 10 moves. Bottom 14 moves. Well, again, what I could use is maybe, they, you know, that's just Manhattan distance, what I just did. So maybe I can use that as my attractiveness. Hey, how attractive is it to go the top route? Well, again, if I know or I know the goal or I have that sense, then I can say, oh, well, it's going to be 10. But the problem is I'm looking for the shortest path. So I want a better number when I'm doing a comparison. And the issue is, right, 10 smaller. Well, again, when we're trying to build these calculations, and especially when we get into probability, I want it to be a bigger number. I want this to be more powerful. So what I can do is inverse it, because that's no longer a true statement. Now this is the bigger of the two numbers, and it's specifically because we inverted it, okay? So, okay, fine, fine, you know, you did all this stuff, but why I kind of mentioned that is, hey, that's the distance to, in our case, the food source. This is me just kind of walking through those different things because you see, I, I seem to, you notice I didn't draw that up here uh, and they, I just kind of kept them on there. The alpha and the betas. All those are asking is, hey, how much more important is the other one, right? Hey, do you want how many other ants have gone this way to be more important than the distance, right? The perceived distance of, to the, the location, right? That's all. Which one do you want? If you make them equal, right? If you just set both A, alpha, and beta to one, these behave equally. If I did something like a five and a two, all I'm saying is I want distance to have a stronger weight in this entire calculation. For my sake, for your sake, when it comes to, I don't know, a midterm, don't worry about alpha and beta. They're one, right? Just don't even worry about them. Why? Because it's extra math. I'm, I'm being nice. I'm being generous. You're welcome. Yeah. Right? But either way, we still see this is me talking about all the different traversals. But as we're working through this algorithm, right, we're plugging in the numbers. Now, when we initially start, this is why I kind of presented this, this is why I've drawn this out, is we're doing that calculation. Well, hey, what is the probability that this amp will take the top route? Okay, well, we look at that tau level. What is the tau level at that particular spot? One. Now, you notice with the sigma, right, the sigma is running total. So I am going to finagle this for a second, because all this turns into, and just so we have it, taking the top route, one multiplied by tau of top, plus one, because it's also the same going Now, bottom. And again, that's what I've got going on there without the, the alphas and betas. And so you can see, all I've done is taken my tau level, whatever, again, I, when I look at a tile, how attractive is the tile? Right? It had a number initially. We set that number to one. Now we get into, oh, these are reversed, aren't they? Sorry. There we are. Right? Okay. Now we keep going. 
Again, that's that calculation. That's where that plugs in. I want to take my tau level, right? That's the one. And I want to apply it to my eta, multiply it by my eta. And so if my eta is going to be one over the distance of those nodes, again, this is why we plugged it in over one, because this eta, or eta over uh, for top becomes one tenth. That becomes one tenth. And what does eta for bottom become? Say last, say proud. One fourteenth. Right? You plug that in. That's just. 0.10, you plug this in, and I'm going to cheat. There we are. That becomes roughly 117, right, and rounding and all that stuff. Oh, well, hey, look at that calculation. Right? One, you know, 10 divided by 15, 17. Ooh, look at what I've just produced. I've produced a probability. The probability that the agent, that single ant, takes the top path is 58%. And you might notice, again, when we think about this band of like math.random, rather than it becoming, hey, you know, 50%. If I were to do math.random, if it's below 58, I would take the top route. If it was over 58, I'd take the bottom route. Question? One over eight, one over ten for those specific choices. One over eight, one over ten. Uh, for eight versus ten or ten versus fourteen, really, like when I made those numbers, it's I, I was just counting how many squares you're hitting. So that that's kind of where I picked that number. Manhattan distance still kind of, or if you did like, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Euclidean distance, right? It would be a different number, but the whole process would still be happening the same way. That's more the important part there. But again, take a look at what we're doing. When you do the math.random, right? Math.random, it generates a random number. If that number is below 58, right? 0 0.58 or less, I just found out which move I'm going to take. Otherwise, take the other one, and I can continue to divide this. What if I had a second route or a third route? Well, I could split them. Right? Let's arbitrarily say I have two other routes. That's the worst squiggly I've ever drawn, uh, middle and bottom. Right? Maybe it has its own cutoff point. Uh, this is, again, you'll start to see this as we keep working towards it. So, again, I plug that in. Uh, just to throw this out there, this is a different way you can look at it, right? I'm showing it to you in this sort of 2D grid-based tile space because, you know, it helps me process it. But, right, this is just edges, weighted edges on a graph going on there. And maybe that weighted edge, the distance is 10 or something like that. But again, as I plug this in, I see I get that 58. That same concept goes on to play. If I were to then have to do this same thing for what's the probability of taking that bottom route, you know, the denominator doesn't change. It's the only the numerator that changes. Right? That becomes 0, 0.7. And that probability, I'm going to just hand wave it because I already know the answer. 
0.42, round it up, right? Questions? So I have decided to take a particular path. Well, I, I haven't decided, but I have one path that has a higher probability than the other path. That part's fine, we get that. Now, the part I'm gonna ask again, or uh, this time, is what also happens to, I don't know, those pheromone levels in the real world? They fade, they evaporate, they're liquid, right? It's, it, it's a, a little dewdrop, a secretion, if you will, right? And it smells. Well, what happens over time? That secretion is going to start to dry up because, again, the ground may absorb it. Wind may carry it. Any number of reasons uh, may kick in. And so as we're dropping pheromones, we also have to factor in, you know, this was just one round. What about next round when maybe some air has hit the pheromone? Maybe some other ants have touched the same pathway. How much pheromone is deposited, but then also how much pheromone is evaporated or goes away? That's where we focus in. And how we look at that, how we tackle that, is its own mathematical equation. Notice this time it's, hey, What's the trail level? What's that tau, right? That number. What's that one for this pathway after traversal? After the ant has made their traversal, found that food source, dropped off their pheromones, and they're back in the colony. And it's about to start round two, right? What happens? Well, this is where we get a new symbol. It's not a P. I know. It looks like a P. It's called rho. Pharaoh men, Pharaoh moan, Pharaoh moan, there you go. That one's pheromones, right. okay? So again, hey, maybe I have like a 5% evaporation rate, right? That's the pheromone evaporation coefficient. That's the big fancy word, right? Maybe I have a 5% pheromone evaporation rate. Well, what am I saying? I'm saying 5% needs to vanish or keep one minus 5%, keep 95% of the old pheromone, and in this case, this is where we're initializing it. You know, here's where you would say that first initial value, right? You have different ways you could work off of it, but what happens when we're dealing with round two? This portion will stay the same, But notice it changes. It's no longer that, you know, initial tau uh, 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 zero, but suddenly it's a delta and a sigma, <laughs> right? L lots of numbers are going on here. Again, sigma, go through all the ants. That's it. Just go through all the ants. What was the difference in pheromones or the trail level from those ants? Okay, it doesn't really answer that question or that, that, that helps explain it, but it doesn't turn it into numbers that I can uh, plug in and calculate, right? Well, again, if we're thinking about M, M is the number of ants, right? And then K is the individual ants. All right, well, all I'm saying here is how many ants dropped pheromones here? And specifically, it's not, you know, that's just counting how many ants, that's not the number I want. It's how much pheromone did ants drop here? That's the part I want you to think about. How much pheromone, let me compare the two. How much pheromone Pheromone was dropped. You can see I'm trying to hurry up. There. That says dropped, not propped. Okay. 
Okay. How much pheromone is dropped? Well, how do I figure out how much pheromone was dropped? So how you can calculate this out is we get more variables. This is, you know, again, I, I introduced them, yes. Q is a constant. You specify it. Again, you're a mathematician. You're not an ant. You're not bound by the laws of biology, right? You decide how much the ant drops or the agent drops each iteration. You know, for my sake, I'll just keep this as one when I'm working with y'all, right? Just to keep everything equal and e you know, easier on you, but that's it. And then L of K. L of K is just saying, well, how much was the cost of that path, right? What's the cost of this top path versus this bottom path? That's all. And specifically, only use this if the ant actually took the path. Remember, I might have 100 ants. Well, not every ant's going this way. Only 58% of the ants may go this way, right? And that's not even true right. So only add this 1 over L of K, or Q over L of K. Only add if the ant took the path. Otherwise, the ant didn't drop pheromones because the ant didn't take the path. They, they took a path somewhere else. And what this will allow you to do is, again, as I'm working through the algorithm, right, let's sum up how many ants and how much pheromone each ant had dropped, right? That's where we're getting this. So we plug that in. That's me explaining it more. And what will happen? Well, let's look at plugging in those numbers specifically, right? Well, right now, I only have one ant going the top way and the bottom way. So technically, there's two ants working right now. One took the top, one took the bottom, right? All right, well, the original tau was a one. Evaporation, eight, uh, evaporation rate, 0 0.5, right, because I say it is. We take the uh, original tau, again, there's our uh, one for there, and we add how much pheromone was dropped, a.k.a. Q, over the cost of the path, 10. All right, well, you do this math equation, you plug this in, that tau level, right, that tau level is going to change from a 1 into a 1.05. Same thing will happen on the bottom, right? Again, we do the calculation, but this time the one ant dropped its one pheromone across the path of 14. Right? Again, that's how much how many squares there are, and instead of it being a 1.05, it's a 1.02. Oh. Now, yes, I get it. That's minuscule, right? But what happens if I increase the number of ants, right? Again, I worked off of just two. Let's increase it. Let's increase it. Now let's say I have eight ants. Five go the top route, three go the bottom route. Well, again, if my Q is one, then the only thing that's gonna change is it's gonna be, instead of it being one-tenth, it's one-tenth plus one-tenth plus one-tenth plus one-tenth plus one-tenth because five ants touched this pathway versus the bottom, one-fourteenth plus one-fourteenth plus one-fourteenth. Feel here? People in the back? Okay, good. So again, notice what's happening to that tau level. The top route, again, I randomly selected the five, right? That way it makes my math easier and I, you know. And so, oh, look at that. I get a 1.45 versus the bottom route didn't have as many ants and is a longer path. The attractiveness, the tau level, uh, Sorry, eta is attractiveness, but the trail level is just not as much, 1.1 suddenly. And if you keep on plugging this in, right, we would start mapping these things out. Now the pathways are different. Now it's a 1.45 for the top route, and it's a 1.16 for the bottom route. Okay, now what? I've built
built numbers. Now what do I do? Well, we've already plugged in. Hold on, I think. We run it again, right? Again, think about it. This is where treat it like it's, it, this is, we got to go back and forth from reality to, or biology to math, right? The ants went. They found the food source. They grabbed the food source. They dropped the pheromones. They came back. Well, again, my pheromones left, and ants, not just one ant, all the ants have gone out, come back. Now it's time for round two or three or whatever. Oh, let's go back because we've just deposited the worm or you know the, the morsel that we have. Now it's time to go back. Is there some sort of restriction on the ant going backwards like on its way along the path? So the question was, is there a restriction? Again, that's you designing it. You can design it so that the ant does go, you know, pathways it's seen before or not. That part, right, is up to you. Um, depends. But as we keep on going, right, we plug it in. Now let's say I'm still working off my eight, eight ants, right? But I'm going to say because that top route had a higher trail level, it became, you know, again, if you were to plug in the probabilities for it, which you will be doing in a second, right? Oh, hey, you know, let's say one additional ant has joined the five. So here's the sign language for five, right? Okay, now you see, hey, we keep on plugging in those numbers. It's still, it's now a 1.45 instead of a one. It's six over 10 instead of five over 10. And look what happens to the trail level. It increases the bottom half or the bottom section. Notice again, because I'm selecting, right? Not as many ants are coming this way. And due to the evaporation level, since not many ants are coming this way, and it's costing you more to take this path, what we're starting to see is, yes, it's still going to grow in trail level. Pheromone is still appearing and being dropped here, but one's growing at a much higher rate. That's where we start to see, because now this one that every other ant has been walking on is starting to become the most attractive pathway to work off of. And so again, let's say the next round, that same thing. You can see, right, notice the difference between the tau levels for that bottom route, right? One hundredth, like barely any increase is happening on the bottom because not as many ants are going across it versus that top route Everyone's dropping pheromones, and so it's just growing. It, again, does it have a cap? No. You know, it's just dependent on what your evaporation rates are and if you have anything that's going to cause it to wipe. So eventually you can see what happens here is as you continue to run this, until you stop the algorithm, right? Again, this is your decision of, like, you get to stop it. What we would end up seeing is some optimal pathway that every other ant is taking because, again, we're thinking about this from the drone-like behavior of ants. An ant takes this pathway because every other ant is taking this pathway. And they're all taking it because everyone is agreeing that this is a good source versus this other one. Here's my relevant joke. Is Rick and Morty still popular? More or less. Okay, I will delete this slide. Anyways, with that out of the way, now it's time for your activity. Uh, let's see, I'll give you 10 minutes. So we'll come back at 355. Calculate out the probabilities for each of those iterations. <laughs> And we 
we are back, everybody. Let me see how you did. Ba -ba -ba -ra -da -da. So if we're kind of pulling this up, all righty. Oh, okay, all right. So a lot of you doing pretty nicely. I'd double check on where you're going here. I think you may have swapped them on accident. Um, do be mindful when it comes to like, um, since I'm seeing the different variations of your, you're plugging it in, <clears throat> I will go ahead and say, typically speaking, I'm asking for, uh, I'm going to just cheat and see what y'all said. Uh, typically, I would be asking for thousands when it, like when it comes to your, your midterms and your final exams or, you know, when I'm asking you to write these things down by hand kind of thing. Three digits, that's fine, like, you know. At that point, if you're off by like a fraction of a, hundred, a thousandth, okay, I get that. I, that part I can, I can fix, right? <clears throat> but that's, that's good enough for me. Um, if you were kind of not, you know, most of you should have gotten it correct, you know, again, because I have it literally on the board. Um, if not, again, that's fine, it's, you know. Uh, seems to, okay, all right, all right, we're seeming to do pretty nicely. If you did not get these correct, you know, be mindful of that, kind of work uh, to see where you can go. If you're feeling froggy, someone put negative one, uh, someone put binary. This is what I get for just giving y'all an open mic. With that out of the way, however, before I kind of jump onto it, what I will kind of stress is once again, However, you you know where however many calculations you got that was in ten minutes, right? So being mindful of that because this is here you go, boom. I, here is the calculator uh, for this, right? Here, oh, look at that. There's the this is how I plugged it all in. This is how I got those numbers. There's how I can see where they all should be at that given probability. Sorry, there's the sixty three. I was freaking out for a second, right? You can already see, oh, look at that, builder. I'm not going to, uh... <gasps> oh, my goodness. Almost like all I do is I go to this slide right here, and then I use the power of automation to just, like, randomly change it until I get tired. This is how I build your exams, by the way. And stop. I don't like that one. I don't like that one. I want gray to go up. Ah, that's fine. I'll, I'll, right? And there you go. And what will I do? I'll take all the stuff that I see, and then I'll format it in the proper way for y'all. And you think that's terrifying. I see some of your gasps. Here's all of the builders that I have for your, your class. I know. My job's super easy. <sighs> Look, you're computer scientists. Learn to automate. Oh, <laughs> moving along only because I have a, a limited amount of time left. So let me, boom, let me just get chat back up. That way I can see everyone. Okay, so again, welcome to Ant Colony Optimization. But what I'm going to do, since I only got about, you know, 15 more minutes, is I'm going to at least very briefly talk about those other two algorithms, right? Because I, I said it's more than just ants today. Oh, and there's that. Um, I will also tell you, hey, just to be nice, uh, I no longer offer, I no longer make you do a third iteration come midterm. Because I see, I've seen how your calculations, how long it takes. It's okay, you can dance and celebrate. I do it too. Anyways, my point being, <clears throat> Again, we're, this is active research in computer science. Like, if you're thinking, toying around the idea of, like, you know, I don't want to be a software engineer. I want to I wanna maybe go to grad school, see what, you know, all these weird science people are doing. Or, uh, you know, the theory classes that you're taking are actually exciting, and you're, you're really interested in those kinds of things. Well, guess what, right? Biologically inspired algorithms, we, we look at what people are doing, or people, we look at what's happening out there in nature, and we say, well, hey, can we simulate that, right? That's like the, uh, the Fibonacci sequence with uh, uh, sunflowers, right? Oh, look at how sunflowers naturally do it. And then we built an algorithm or a calculation that models it. That's where... In this case, we're talking about what is known as the whale optimization algorithm. Because just like ants, 
whales got to eat. And they have their own hunting method for doing this. Specifically, uh, the way you can start to think about it is, well, the whale, again, it's got you know, very, very fine teeth. It's a giant entity in a, in a giant ocean. And so, you know, it just kind of opens its mouth and eats, right? But that's not just it. Otherwise, it would be doing that the entire time. No. What happens is it uses a concept known as bubble netting, right? Again, it's a mammal, so it has to breathe. And so what's it going to do? Well, that nice little, instead of pooping out a pheromone, it's going to poop out, it's going to burp. It's going to go, it's going to shoot air out of that blowhole. Why? Well, again, it's going to go under the krill, under the fish. Ready for some animation? Yeah, you don't get this on Disney Plus. Oh, well, you shot the air up. What happens? Well, again, you're, you're, a, you're a fish or you're, you're krill. You just know, oh, get out of my way. Right? You got out of the way. Or maybe you got it a little closer. And well, what's the whale doing? It's circling. It's not, you know, it's not just a, a linear 2D graphic. It's circling. It's doing this in a three-dimensional as it goes up. So as it moves to the other side, right, hey, I'm going to drop another. I'm going to burp out another bunch of air. Uh. Are you ready for the final animation? I don't have one. <laughs> I know. You know what? Pay me more. Anyways, how does this all pan out? Again, I don't have enough time. Also, I am not an expert at this. I, I present this to you mostly because I know faculty here are doing it. And it's, you know, hey, get you, this is what our research faculty are doing. But it's just another math equation, no different than what I was plugging in. It's its own math equation, right? These are just vectors where you're doing calculations off of these vectors, multiplying a vector times a thing, dividing it by a thing, and multiplying more stuff, right? You just need to know what the values are, and there you go, plug them in. Uh, so again, I, I sort of have them. Again, this is not my area of specialty. But you keep plugging them in. The parts I can you know, very quickly recognize is, hey, there's a vector of random number. OK, well, that's just zero, you know, between 0 and 1. You know how math.random works. Hey, there's a vector for A. And A is just slowly going from 2 to 0. Oh. Well, visually, it starts to look like this because, again, as we are, as the whale encircles or our agent that is behaving like a whale encircles a goal condition, it's zeroing in on that target. So it gradually starts to get closer. So, hey, let me burp out some air, make an assessment, shift things around. Burp out some air, burp out some air, burp out some air, burp, 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 burp. burp. Or lunchtime. And so again, that's one way uh, why I kind of present this. If you're feeling, again, froggy, if you, this like got you a little excited that I, I hand waved and made a, uh, ants and whales move, right? Uh, reach out to Dr. Stefan Hever here at NC State. He is actively looking at this. And specifically why I kind of present this is when I say actively looking at it, again, you get paid as a research professor to say, hey, here's an algorithm. Has anyone used it on the other computer science problems out there in the world? You learned 316 or traveling salesman in 316. I showed you sliding puzzle. I showed you the in Queens puzzle. I've shown you linear assignment. I've shown you many of the problems in computer science that we attempt to tackle. Why don't I get money and say, does whale optimization work for linear assignment? How does that even work? Well, again, that's why you get, go to grad school. Like, you sit down to think about it. Right? People will pay you money. Here's the pseudocode for it. Go, you know, if, talk to Dr. Heber if you want a little bit more detail on it. He is still here. Right? Another one, again, I'm just, these are much more rapid fire. We're not plugging them in. You will not need to do the whale or teacher student uh, in, uh, on a midterm. I don't want, don't even worry about it. This is, again, mostly just 
seeing what other meta heuristics are out there, seeing what other approaches are out there. And so, well, if I used ants and I used physics and I used evolution and I used whales, what about us? What about me, Britain? What about me? Right? What about the student-teacher relationship? What is it about us? This is how we learn, right? Can we model that? Can we make that a math equation? Well, okay. And again, what this one is attempting to do is, well, you, if, you, if you think about what the teacher-student relationship is, it's sort of broken down into, right, a phase where I do all the talking, right? I'm doing the entertaining thing. I'm showing you the math equations. I know the answers, but I'm trying to teach you as agents, right? And then there's the student phase. Notice how I told you to, you know, work on an activity. And I, I encourage you to, hey, chat amongst yourselves because one of you may understand this. One of you may not. And isn't it a learning process when the person who does not understand it listens to the person who does understand it, and a light bulb maybe goes off in the head? What do you know? And so again, that's exactly what this entire pseudocode flowchart, whatever, is doing. It's like, hey, I'm going to go ahead and collect all of your answers. And now this is where it's not, you know, real world, right? I'm going to make my, I'm going to distribute out the, the information. I'm going to tell you what uh, the best known configuration currently is, right? Because that's what I'm doing. Oh, you make a learn. Then what happens? Well, then talk amongst yourselves. Maybe you have, you know, again, I, maybe we don't have a full on, here's the best solution. I'm more of a facilitator to the best currently known solution. And what are you doing? Well, then you pair up, you know, look to your left, look to your right. That's your neighbor. You share your answers. You share your work. Who had the better work? Again, because we quantify it and we measure which one is better. Oh, well, depending on who did the better job, right, function x of i over or against function x of j, compare my students, who had the better job? Oh, well, if x of i had the better job, or sorry, if x of j had the better job, x of i updates. Otherwise, x of j updates or something like that. Yeah. Oh, and we keep on going with this exact same process. Oh, yeah, there it is. Uh, uh, j is which one goes over. But that same process happens. And so, again, the one who does not have the better answer or the better approach is learning and, be, you know, also coming up. So to keep on going, there's other ones as well. This one's been really interesting. Uh, one of the students uh, a few years back uh, um, showed me this video, and I think this is to a TED Talk. Uh, I don't have enough time for it, but if you have a solid, like, 20, 30 minutes, I strongly encourage it. It's also on Moodle, so you can just click on the link there. But what we have seen is slime mold is able to also do pathfinding and able to essentially provide an efficient, optimal solution to the traveling salesman problem. This, these oats that we're seeing here, right? This is oats, and someone just dropped a slime mold on there. Well, what happens? The slime mold is looking for food. It's a living organism, no different than an ant or a whale, and so it starts looking for food. Well, how does it tackle this problem? If you watch the video, it, it's very much like a breadth-first search. Let me try everything until I find a food source. Then that almost serves as like a hub for a second where it, it, it understands, hey, that's a food source. Now I'm going to do a breadth-first search from here. Because, hey, explore, explore from here. Then what happens? Well, after it's explored as much as it can, you know, this is where it's not just like it's doing this assessment as it's doing the exploration. But over time, right, the food sources are found. No other food sources are happening. And so what happens after that? Well, the slime will restrict or constrict. It will remove these excess tendrils that aren't providing 
a food source, right? This is, it prunes itself. And what will happen, again, from 11 hours to you know, 15 hours later, it was able to show an optimal configuration to the Tokyo Transport Network. So where, yeah, the subway is in Tokyo. If you were to map this on top of you know, the subway map, it would look eerily similar because that's a train station. That's a train station. That's a train station. So, hey, how do I make an optimal configuration of subway stops? Why use y'all? I'm going to go buy, I'm going to just go buy some slime. And it will figure it out too, right? Can you model this? Can you make this a math equation? If you can, I'm sure someone's willing to pay you money. And so that's, again, how do you decide which one to pick? Uh, I got about four minutes, so I, I can finish, right? How do you pick? Well, one, it's you be familiar with these things, right? You know, again, if you don't know of a, a, a particular algorithm, you wouldn't think to use it. Now that you know about simulated annealing, genetic algorithms, ant colony optimization, whales, right? Now you may be feeling inclined to try them out. It's like, oh, let me, let me see what this whale thing is. That way I can maybe get some experience with Dr. Heber, and you know, that's a letter of recommendation I can get to grad school. Oh, I saw a head pop up, right? Well, again, you have to have the familiarity with it. Then you have to kind of be not just familiar, you have to be aware of it. If you can do that, well, again, that's what the NSF is looking for, the National Science Foundation. They're, you know, they're just like, hey, tell us research that you would like to do, and if we like it, we'll give you money. And that's how you, you as a professor get money, right? So again, you can, and then what do you do? Well, this is where, just like, oh, and this is a uniform. Even when we start getting into like the, the chat GPTs and everything, you see this. What do we do? Well, we take the agent and say, my approach performed this well. Well, since all these other approaches also work, typically they may have their code or you implement it yourself or you hire someone to implement all the different versions. And then you do a comparison. How does my approach or my algorithm, how does whale optimization compare to simulated annealing or compare to genetic algorithms? And that is how you publish papers. I know, wild, right? So the last little bit, and I'll send you along your way. Again, I have some links here. Um, just in case you are, you know, everything that I've shown you is weird and you want to see more. Uh, so again, here's some examples. Uh, here's a keyboard layout that was generated by genetic algorithms. Here's a Java genetic algorithms library. And here's that uh, slime mold video that I was just talking about. But with that, again, make sure problem set two is finished up. And I'll see you all next week. Take care.